The ICJ judgment very much in sharp focus. It's topical starts right now. A very good evening to you, South Africa, and those watching around the world. My name is Blaine Herman, and this is It's Topical. Our digital audience with us tonight, there they are. Good to see them. Among them, our guests. We're going to take their questions for our guests in a short while. Look, there's been mixed reactions to the ruling of the International Court of Justice. Part of the order, Israel must, in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of the Genocide Convention. What does that mean? Well, the order went on to say this in particular, right? The killing of members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about a physical destruction in, ho in a whole or in part. And the last one was the imp imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. The court also called for the immediate and unconditional release of hostages, that's important. The court, however, stopped short of, of ordering an immediate halt to military operations. So, so how does that form part of the calculus? How is it weighed up in terms of what I just mentioned now, in terms of the order? Tonight, we are going to break down the court's order for you, look at developments and, and the measures that needs to be taken, what we know and why it matters, what is the legality and what is the practicality. Remember, Israel's prime minister is saying they, they will continue to do what is necessary to defend their country and defend its people, adding that the charge of genocide leveled against Israel is not only false, it's outrageous. And decent people everywhere should reject it. South Africa's president, on the other hand, Cyril Ramaphosa, calling this a victory for international law, for human rights, and above all, for justice. Which leads us to the question of the week. And we're asking you, while South Africa's president has hailed the ICJ's ruling as a victory for justice, and the Israeli Prime Minister labeling it as, you know, outrageous, this ruling, what's your thoughts with regards to this? Let us know at its topical SABC. Walk with me as always, let's get you some context. What about the possibility of this ruling being vetoed? at the Security Council. What then? What sort of options does South Africa have if this order is challenged? We're going to let you know with the better minds on the program tonight. Share your thoughts as well at its topical SABC perspective coming up. All right, let's get you some context. And as always, we turn to the magic wall, why, what we know and why it matters. Tonight, my guest, SABC News International Editor, Sophie Mokwena, joins me now live. Sophie, good to have you on the program. Let's break it down for the viewer, tee it up in terms of our discussion tonight. So we're looking at the provisional measures on Israel. What did South Africa initially want? What did they get? Well, uh, you know that the intention was to ensure that the ceasefire because the ceasefire will assist in implementing some of the provisional requirements in terms of ensuring that you intervene to save lives, but to ensure that uh, those who are affected are able to get food, they are able to get shelter, they are able to get water in Gaza. And therefore, uh, as you pointed out, there's no word ceasefire. Mm. But South Africa is saying that by imposing these measures you right. will be able to implement some of these measures if there's some reprieve right. in terms of fighting and therefore the other important issue is uh, they got where the judges said right. there must be a responsibility from the Israel government mm -hmm. to prevent the genocide. Mm -hmm. As you know that this case didn't deal with Correct. whether they have committed genocide, but they intend or this will lead to genocide. Yeah. And therefore the judges, 15 of those judges said, 
prevent the genocide. Yeah. The two didn't agree. And then you have to implement and abide by the provisions yeah. immediately. Right. And then you prevent and punish incitement. This emanates from statements right. made by officials from Israel government, you know, the prime minister, the ministers, the defense force. Secondly, at prevent the destruction of evidence. For me, this is very, very mm -hmm. important because this is the provisional process. When you go to the case, you need to present evidence yeah. as South Africa and those who are supporting you that uh, uh, because you want to argue that uh, Israel has committed genocide, therefore prevent destruction of evidence because right. normally when there are these kind of cases, either in the ICJ or in the ICC, there's tendency to destroy evidence so that those who are supposed to be held accountable, uh, get away with murder. Right. And then humanitarian assistance. Yeah. This was the main issue yeah. from the United Nations and the Secretary General, you know, last week, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, he was very, very strong on this, including right. the World Health Organization. Because that's where the argument comes from South Africa, is specifically about the ceasefire. Because if you don't have a ceasefire or a halt in hostilities, uh, how do you get humanitarian aid in there? That's a big question. And then within a one month, Israel needs to submit a, a report. A report. This is part of accountability. We told you to do this. How mm. far are you? Right. And I think Israel uh, will argue that already when they were presenting their case, they pointed out to steps that they have taken in terms of ensuring that civilians are not caught in a crossfire, right. but the numbers are uh, different. Right. They also presented uh, information in relation to denial of uh, bombardment of hospitals and facilities. And they also right. said that they've agreed to humanitarian uh, aid going to Gaza, but even today, mm. when you look at what's happening on social media, there are Israelis who are blocking a entrance to Gaza mm. on one of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the borders, and therefore it, it doesn't speak to what they said right. during the hearing. So you would notice, as you mentioned, Sophie, the top number here is the judges that voted for, and you notice that there was one judge in particular that consistently voted against uh, these provisional measures, and that was the judge from Uganda. Uganda issuing a statement clarifying their position, saying that the judge from Uganda, nationality from Uganda, is independent. That's her opinion. And you would expect that of a judge, correct? You wouldn't necessarily expect a judge to adopt the position of a country. But why was it so important for the, the country to issue that clarification? Well, when I spoke to Dr. Navi Pillay, yeah. who is familiar with these processes, as you know that she is leading a commission, the UN commission that is investigating settlements uh, in, in, in Palestine and uh, whether uh, legally uh, or is it illegal. Mm. She told me that when she looked at the panel, these are eminent men and women who can be independent in their application right. of law and looking at the case of Myanmar. But the backlash, the backlash mm. since Friday and Saturday, Uganda felt that they should clarify and make a distinction or show the world that what she is doing mm. is independent and what their positions are in right. relation to the Palestinian question is different and that is why they did evoke uh, in terms of how they have voted mm -hmm. in the uh, in the uh, in the vote in the general assembly they've been supporting the resolutions right. that calls for ceasefire and all of that right. so i think it had to do with cis with backlash particularly yeah. on the African continent, mm, mm, because mm. people were linking it with atrocities, that alleged atrocities in Uganda that right. perhaps Museveni told her to vote that okay. way because he's scared that at some point in time he will have to appear mm. before the ICJ. But uh, uh, the government then took a decision to clarify that matter and pointed out that look at how we have conducted yeah. ourselves in the Security Council. So what are we talking about in terms of the judges? There's about 15 judges. I think it's a, a nine-year term that they get. Cross-section uh, from around the world. Then you have the 
judges ad hoc. An example of that was Judge Mosaneke. Mosaneke. Um, when you look at this, this unit in particular, Sophie, um, and they pass judgments, what does that tell us in terms of the direction it's going? Well, they've been consistent. Oh. They have been consistent and they do listen. The fact that they allowed this case or this uh, provisional measures to be po imposed on Israel. Remember, Israel had argued that they don't have uh, the right to listen or to this request by yeah. South Africa. But they took an independent uh, position to say, when we look at the matter at hand and when we look at what the convention is saying on genocide yeah. and our own uh, guidelines that guides us as a world court, the organ of the United mm. Nations, this matter must be heard. And these are state parties right. and they are signatories to the genocide convention. Yeah. And therefore, for now, one can say uh, they will exercise their independent mm. uh, judgments when the real case is heard. Right. But secondly, one thing that I noted, even the judge of the former Supreme Court judge of Israel, mm. there mm. are other issues where he did agree with other uh, judges and therefore right. you yeah. can see even there that he was uh, exercising his uh, independent uh, uh, thinking in terms of uh, what needs to be done on prevention yeah. and punishment of those who are inciting genocide and he agrees yeah. and then prevent the destruction of evidence yeah. he agrees that when the case uh, is had you can bring that evidence right. so we'll work through the evidence but secondly what made people to attack the judge from uganda it's because she's a human rights mm, mm. Uh, legal person right. and therefore people thought that for human rights, you can see that yeah. the human rights of the Palestinians are violated. Right. So it's very important and something that you touched on uh, with regards to the bigger case. This, these are provisional measures ordered. Uh, the bigger case with regards to genocide and where that becomes important, the important word there is intent. That will take a long time, correct? That will take a long time because you that, have yeah. to present evidence yeah. and uh, that is why the panel announced or made a ruling that don't destroy evidence right. because we still have to deal with the merits of the case in relation to making a ruling whether Israel has committed genocide. Right. But these this is the allegation from South Africa, and South Africa is firm, and South Africa is saying, I'm going to present evidence. Right. We're going to flesh it out a bit more. Sophie is going to stay with us for our discussion as well. We thank her very much indeed. We also want you to have your say as well. So we go to the regular word on the street feature. We took to the streets of Johannesburg seeking diverse insights and perspectives on this topic, and this is what you had to say. I think the judgment is indeed a step towards the resolution of the question of Israel and Palestine. Um, it's an important step because it has ordered Israel to stop the atrocities, to stop the attacks, to stop the injustice that is committing against the people of Palestine. What was very positive about the decision is that they insisted that the hostages be released so we can look forward to that hopefully uh, well uh, you know it's a question of maybe the, the pot calling the kettle black i don't think the case should have been brought before the international court in the first place uh, i think south africa has got potential but they need to deal with their own problems on the african continent first the ceasefire would have been the first that we were, or they were, supposed to do. <laughs> but now, looking at the way it is, even the ICJ themselves, they are being told what to do. They are doing as the main players are telling them what to do. And yeah, that's a picture that we're getting. I think we're very happy with the, the results. I think it's a, it's a first step towards uh, towards looking into more closely what, uh, what Israel will be doing in the in next few months. Uh, yes, and I think I was expecting a ceasefire, but uh, but look, it's already it's a good it's a good step towards the right direction, I would say. In terms of the verdict, um, I think we would have hoped for more out of it, but I, from from where we were, I think before the case went to the ICJ, I think it is a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think it's a really good 
reflection on how international justice is working that they ruled in favor. Um, the evidence was very strong and it does make you hopeful. All right, we really appreciate your thoughts on this matter. We've got so much to discuss. We're going to take a quick break. Our panel discussion after this. Welcome back. You're watching It's Topical. Important discussion. We're breaking down the ICJ ruling, issuing provisional measures. The order was handed down this week. Lots of reaction with regards to it. But what does it mean in terms of the legality? What does it mean in terms of the practicality? To help me, uh, Sophie McQuena is still with us, SABC News International Editor. We also have Professor Tuli Madoncella from the Center of Social Justice at Stellenbosch University, as well as uh, Natasha Hausdorf. Uh, she's a barrister and a legal director of UK Lawyers for Israel's uh, Charitable Trust. Uh, good to have you on the program. We also have our digital audience as well. We're going to get their take in a short while. Professor, maybe to you first, uh, regarding what came out of this judgment. ICJ stopping short of calling for a ceasefire, uh, but ordering that Israel must adhere to these provisional measures. Um, but in order to do that, in terms of maybe the humanitarian issue, how do we get aid into Gaza, do you think that that means a cessation of hostilities, a halting of, of hostilities in Gaza? Absolutely. Greetings to you and to fellow panelists and viewers. My reading of the judgment is exactly what you just said, that South Africa got everything it asked for, but in different wording from the the ICJ. Maybe the only thing South Africa did not get was the requirement that an investigation team be allowed to start doing work in Gaza. But in so far as desisting from doing all of the things that constitute genocide in terms of articles two, three, etc. South Africa got mm. a year that um, the actions that Israel has been taking up until now can plausibly regard it as genocide. And therefore, you can't read the remedial action in a manner that is divorced from the findings. Mm. Because the remedial action says stop doing certain things start doing certain things. And obviously it means then Israel is no longer allowed to carpet, to carpet bomb people in Gaza, is no longer allowed to blockade medical supplies, food, water, etc. Israel is no longer allowed right. to keep displacing people. And if anything if that Israel has been doing has been since then, is now in violation. All right. Uh, All right. Professor, I think we uh, just have a, a bit of a technical a, issue with your line. We'll try to fix line. that up. But maybe uh, let me go to Barrister uh, Hausdorf. Um, is that your understanding, uh, Barrister? Uh, because I'm, I'm just reading the first part of this order, uh, saying that Israel must, in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of the Genocide Convention. And this includes, and I'll just read two, killing members of the group and causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of that group. How do they even start to adhere to this order without ce a ceasefire? Well, good evening. It's very good to be with you. And it's very important, especially in light of the extraordinary analysis we just heard, to correct the record on so much of the reporting uh, of this order and clarify uh, that in this regard, the court has simply ordered Israel comply with the Genocide Convention, which Israel has been crystal clear uh, that it has always been in compliance with. There is nothing new here, and there are no substantive orders other uh, than uh, the requiring of of a report uh, from uh, the State of Israel uh, as to how it is complying with the Genocide Convention. Um, the court has not made any findings. That's critical to be clear on. Uh, and it has not directed Israel to alter 
its conduct in any way. The court is not in a position to assess the manner in which Israel is conducting uh, the war against Hamas. And these provisional measures were considered by the Ugandan judge, Sebutinde, uh, to be entirely um, uh, irrelevant, uh, not advancing the legal position uh, at all. The word that she used, in fact, was redundant, simply because they restate the requirements of the Genocide Convention itself. I'll agree with my fellow panelists on one count. South Africa has succeeded here, but only in succeeding to use the court as a political tool to advance an agenda of lawfare. And unfortunately, international law generally, the International Court of Justice specifically, uh, and the rights of the Palestinians in particular uh, are all going to suffer as a result of the discrediting of the International Court of Justice and the abuse of international law to pursue an agenda right. against Israel. Because if any of uh, the, the South Africans watching this, or indeed those around the world, actually care about the ordinary Palestinians in Gaza, they will be doing their utmost to ensure that the abuse that they are suffering by Hamas is put to an end. And unfortunately, what we have seen play out in the international discourse around this decision and clearly it's been celebrated by Hamas. South Africa is doing the bidding of a terrorist organization in this regard. That is not serving the interests of ordinary Palestinians. South Africa has come out and said that they condemned the attack by Hamas on October 7th. They put that on record. But Sophie, let me bring you in with regards to, so what, what changes then? If, if Israel's prime minister says they will do whatever it takes to defend their, their country, and I guess they have a right to defend their country, then you have on the other hand these orders, the provisional orders. Um, how does that fit part of the calculus of any change that is gonna be seen on the ground? Well, clearly there is change. A slight change as I pointed out when we were looking at uh, those provisional orders or uh, implementation thereof Israel when it was presenting its case at the ICJ it did point out to scaling down it did point out to issues that they are doing on the ground and many people had then said that they were anticipating that the ruling will be in this form where they will be required mm -hmm. to take responsibility in ensuring that uh, there is no genocide, uh, preserving of information, reporting back to the court in terms of what they are doing now. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, let's listen properly to what he said. He, 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 he changed the tone. He started by saying we respect international law and we respect this court mm. because it was established after the Jews went through terrible time and they are the signatories, the first signatories, South Africa a signatory too. Right. Therefore you can't establish an institution and turn around and reject everything. Yes, you have a right to criticize, disagree or agree with an institution for better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then, so he went further to say, however, we will continue to defend uh, the citizens of right. Israel and our country. No one who's got a sound mind will deprive any country from protecting its territory and its citizens. Correct. But as you do that, how do you ensure that you don't commit mm -hmm. either crimes against humanity or you don't commit a genocide. So you right. have to strike a balance. And when you listen to that clip on Friday after the judgment, you can hear that, yes, they still feel that they are right and they have to ensure that they bring back those hostages, yeah. but they do take into cognizance that uh, this is an important institution, an organ of the United Nations. Right. And also they are signatories to the, uh, to the ICJ. And therefore, I think Dr. Navi Pile summed it well when she said that uh, if Israel doesn't comply with what the ICJ said, yeah. it will be up to member states of the UN and the Security Council to ensure that uh, Israel does comply. Because these right. are provisional measures. Nobody has said they've committed genocide. The matter must be heard later. 
I, w I want to touch uh, on the consequences of not abiding because this is a binding uh, judgment. Uh, Professor Madunsela, before we move on to that, I, I just want to talk about the issue of the hostages. Um, and as you know, the, the court ordered the immediate release of the hostages. Do you think South Africa can play a bigger role in trying to get those hostages home? Firstly, the court did not order the release of the hostages. It, it was not within its remit to do so. The court called for the release of the hostages. Correct. And, um, and of course, that's a humanitarian appeal because um, it is one of the issues that are uh, at the heart of this letter. I would like to respectfully disagree with the barrister from the UK. I don't know if UK law is different from the law of the world and the law in South Africa. But my understanding of the law is these were preliminary proceedings. And there were findings on the preliminary issues. And not the preliminary issues. The first finding was there is jurisdiction to entertain these matters, that there is a dispute, and that thirdly, the acts that South Africa complains of as genocidal acts can be plausibly regarded as genocidal acts. That is a finding, and it is a preliminary finding. It's not a finding on the merits. It doesn't say uh, Israel is committing genocide, but it says that prima facie, it is, in lay people's language, on the face of it, Israel is committing genocide, or Israel is probably committing genocide. That's just a simple interpretation of that judgment. Of course, that was then the basis of the remedies. And if you separate the remedies from the finding, mm -hmm. then you are lost. Barrister, how do you how do you weigh that up in terms of uh, the prima, prima facie uh, findings? Obviously, the merits will need to be assessed in terms of intent. But how does that weigh up uh, what uh, Professor Madonsela has said? Well, I think it assists in particular to look at the dissenting opinion uh, and how this calls out uh, the break that we have seen uh, by the International Court of Justice from uh, previous um, case law uh, and how the concept of plausibility is being stretched in this regard. Paragraph 54 of the court's order makes it crystal clear that the court has only addressed plausibility of whether the rights claimed by South Africa fall under the convention, but it has not assessed the plausibility of whether there has been any breach of convention rights. Uh, and by all accounts, if we look at the figures, uh, even those that were quoted by the court, uh, which have to be uh, assessed as coming from uh, a Hamas-controlled health ministry and therefore can on no account be taken at face value. But even on that basis, uh, if any assessment of the actual claims of breach of the convention uh, were to have been conducted by the court, we would have seen some analysis um, of the fact that uh, Israel appears to be uh, being able to target Hamas and spare civilians in an unparalleled fashion certainly uh, unparalleled in the history of urban armed conflict. Uh, but we didn't see that because the court was clear that it was only assessing whether the claims brought by South Africa were in fact within the realms of the Genocide Convention. I appreciate that might sound like a technical distinction to your audience, but it is critical, especially where it seems that over the last couple of days, this order has been so badly misrepresented, even by lawyers who are uh, acclaimed experts in their field. Uh, and it's, it's troubling because it means that Hamas uh, and other supporters of Hamas have been celebrating uh, what in fact uh, was a bit of a non-entity. Um, the conclusions reached by the court were in that respect tautologous. Let's get our digital audience um, on board and, and, and get their take with regards to how they see this. Uh, Jody, let's talk to you. Um, you know, having, having seen or heard the analysis since the ruling was handed down, do you expect any fundamental change on the ground? Ah, good evening and thank you. Um, this is a devastating blow to Israel's international standing. It is a moral victory, right? Genocide is the crime of all crimes. And at this point, the accusation is not meritless. I would start with that. 
Let me talk about the perhaps the secondary consequences. I think destigmatizing the word genocide was incredibly important. It is now legitimate to actually use that term to describe Israel's apartheid and all of the effects, right? The genocide has been ongoing. It predates the 7th of October, 2023. This has been a sustained campaign over many, many years. We are just witnessing the final phase, which is the um, extermination phase. So it's really important that the word genocide is mm. now embedded in the public consciousness, right? People understand what it is, they understand the phases, and in that way, it can support movements like BDS. So that would be an unintended consequence, but a really positive one, um, where people are able to actually exercise um, some sort of, uh, they don't feel as impotent, they are able to contribute. So I think there are many positive right. effects as it relates to the ruling beyond just what we are discussing this evening. So uh, let me just start off by mentioning right. that I think that's very positive. Jody, thank you very much indeed. Let's hear from Ariel. Good evening and thank you for having me and hi to all the listeners. I just wanted to make a note on the ruling because prior to handing down the provisional measures and notably the lack of a ceasefire uh, mentioned explicitly the court listed multiple acts of destruction it highlighted the devastation that was present in gaza and despite this despite the enormous amount of damage that had been caused and the disregard of all the evidence provided by the israelis the court still didn't call for a ceasefire and i think what this shows us in between the lines or at least that the court tacitly accepted the fact that there was some form of just conflict being waged by the Israelis. And the Israelis made it very clear that they were targeting Hamas and that it was a reaction to the October 7th attacks where Hamas broke a ceasefire that had previously been brokered. And the Israelis went in with the mandate of eliminating a terrorist organization in the name of self-defense. Throughout this entire conflict, in one of the most complicated and densely populated areas on the planet, it still managed Mm. to wage a war in which the world has witnessed an incredible level, and Ms. Uh, Hausdorff mentioned this, of regard for civilian life and attempting to prevent unnecessary civilian casualties as all life lost is tragic. Right. So the court looked at all this evidence. The court saw this, mentioned it prior to giving its provisional measures, and then still did not give a ceasefire. And I right. think as South Africans requested an urgent in uh, immediate cessation to the hostilities, I think it is a massive blow to the South African to the African uh, application. Ariel, thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Uh, Jeremiah, I see your hand and Mark as well. We'll come back to you in a short while. Uh, Professor Modinsel, I just want to bring you in with regards to your take of why the court didn't explicitly call for a ceasefire. Thank you. Firstly, the court was very technical and very elaborate on its reasoning. And with due respect to Ariel, it never said the things that he claims the court took into consideration. It never said Israel had done its best to prevent killing civilians, mass displacing them, blockading medical aid, blockading um, food, water, etc. In fact, it said the opposite. My own reading of why it may not have ordered a ceasefire is simply a legal technicality. Mm. It's not the same here as having the Ukraine war, where you have Ukraine and Russia being sovereign countries with armies, etc., and being signatories of the convention. So if the court had ordered a ceasefire in those words, any continued attack, even directly on Hamas, would have been regard regarded as a violation of the convention. Right. But so far, the court, no the court noted in broad daylight that Israel has been killing civilians. It's right there in the judgment. There's no way in this court where it says, in this judgment, where it says Israel has been trying to avoid killing civilians. In fact, if you look at the way Israel is watching this war, is that it's killing as many civilians as it can find with the hope that at least maybe 0.1% of them mm. might be us. But the court... That's an outrageous allegation. But 
can we please respect each other? Go ahead, uh, uh, Professor Madunsel. I'll get your, your take, Barrister, uh, in a short while. Just uh, if you can conclude your thoughts, uh, Professor. Well, the last thing is the court also read painstakingly the genocidal or the probably genocidal statements made by Israeli leaders. And of course, if we're looking at the order that talks about stopping people who are committing or causing genocide and not being complicit in genocide, it would include stopping those statements that are inciting people to commit genocide. Uh, Barrister Hausdorff? Well, the court didn't consider uh, intent at all. I've already explained the uh, remit of their considerations, but the nature of the allegations that we've heard now from a number of members of, uh, of, of your panel um, underscore what it is that South Africa was seeking to achieve. Uh, a rewriting of uh, the current events uh, and the promotion of these blood libels of Israel uh, committing genocide or targeting civilians. It's important to make a distinction between the general allegations of breaches of international law, unfounded as they are, that we have just heard, and the specific allegation of genocide, which is grotesque, especially the day after International Holocaust uh, Memorial Day that was marked uh, by right-thinking individuals uh, all around the world yesterday. South Africa is seeking to shoehorn this case into uh, genocide specifically is because of a technicality, because it seeks to use the hook of the Genocide Convention, which Israel is a party to. Uh, and you mentioned earlier Netanyahu's comments about Israel, of course, abiding by international law. Those are not new. Israel has always been clear about it prizing above all its international law obligations. That is why it is going uh, even beyond what international humanitarian law requires with respect to its conduct of the armed conflict in Gaza. Yeah. Uh, but Netanyahu was clear in this respect that Israel has consistently been complying with its international law obligations and that the Jews in Israel have a unique understanding of what genocide is. Let us not forget that this term was coined by Raphael Lemkin, also a Jew, in the aftermath of the Holocaust to be able to provide a terminology for the targeting of Jews because they are Jews. And so it is particularly malicious, grotesque and morally repugnant that South Africa would seek to utilize this particular term against Israel, albeit that I say it does it for technical reasons and not because there is any foundation or basis to the gross uh, misrepresentations that has been put before the court. But this important uh, issue that I, I have to call out, this idea that Israel is targeting civilians, is nothing to do with the concept of genocide. It is part of the mud that the South African legal team sought to throw, along with these absurd allegations of apartheid, which I would consider to be an insult to all South Africans that suffered under real apartheid in South Africa. When you, when you talk, when you talk uh, Barrister, when you talk about the mud being thrown, how do you then explain to the public about the thousands of people that have been killed. I think it's, it's over 25,000 people that have been killed in Gaza. Uh, innocent people, according to the United Nations. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. According to the United Nations, uh, that, that is not the case because these figures are coming from the Hamas-controlled ministry. I would begin by asking a series of questions, which I would encourage your audience uh, to pose likewise with respect to that figure. Uh, firstly, where has it come from? Hamas, an internationally prescribed terrorist organization that cannot be trusted, and those figures are unable to be independently verified. That is question number one. Question number two, how did these individuals die? Because we have reports confirmed also by the United States uh, that has endorsed them of Hamas targeting individual civilians, shooting them, bombing them. We also know that Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad rockets fired out of the Gaza Strip, aiming towards Israeli civilians, frequently fall short in the Gaza Strip, killing Palestinian civilians. Mm. So question number two is how many of those numbers have been killed uh, by Hamas and other Palestinian terrorist groups? And question number three is goes to your, your, your assumption of innocence here, because the IDF has been clear. Been clear. It knows it that knows. it has, it has over 9,000 9, terrorists. Terror. If that is the case, uh, then those are certainly not being reflected in, fact, in the number that the Hamas has put out, because they make no distinction between terrorists and civilians. 
What? Israel, in upholding the laws of armed conflict, distinguishes between civilian and combatant, civilian objects. combatant objects. And that is why, that is why in fact, the judgment of the court, the order uh, that we saw, right. uh, when reference is made to homes, schools, hospitals, mosques uh, being destroyed, the absence of context which tells us right. that Hamas routinely, as a matter of course, uses civilian and protected infrastructure as part of its terror uh, network, that needs to be called out. Right. And the fact that the court didn't even feel able to reference that in the context of making these provisional me measures is a shameful day for the International Court of Justice and does not bode for right. international order. Let me bring in Sophie. Uh, with regard to the numbers that you're hearing uh, from the United Nations, etc., from our president who addressed the nation, um, South Africa's president who addressed the nation, um, how off the mark uh, are we? Well, if Israel is denying the numbers, well, it's fine. But allow investigation or independent investigators so that the whole world can have a better sense of what transpired allow independent investigators mm. so that these numbers can be verified. And I think that speaks to the judgment where it says don't destroy evidence right. so that you are able at the end of the day also to verify whether these numbers that are being bended around are correct. Even the UN has issued uh, numbers in terms of the healthcare workers who have died. The organizations representing media have issued numbers yeah. in terms of journalists who have died. So the best way to deal with this disagreement in terms of numbers you have to verify right. data and therefore allow independent investigators to do just that. And it can be UN right. investigators. And as you know, there's a, a night vigil held in honor of the journalists that have been killed in various parts of the country uh, tonight as we speak. I just want to talk about the way forward before I go back to my guests. Um, the ICJ ruling, what's the chances of it being vetoed at the Security Council? There is a possibility. The United States of America has already responded to the judgment and therefore I can see U.S. making an about 10. U.S. is supporting Israel and it's understandable. Remember the military capability of uh, Israel also. Uh, United States of America has to take responsibility if finally uh, when you look at the case uh, and the merits, somebody has to account. And therefore, I think is America is preempting processes. And I think it may not agree with the interpretation yep. of the judgment. We're going to see the same issue playing itself in the Security mm. Council. As you can see now, that uh, even legal minds, uh, people are interpreting this uh, judgment right. in terms of uh, how they see it. So if legal minds are doing this, what about politicians? Because Security Council, it's right. nothing but politics. So I expect tomorrow yeah. when Algeria is requesting this matter to be uh, discussed, definitely we may see uh, the same situation right. and and then yeah. what, what's the option for South Africa if it is indeed a veto they have the option of the United Nations General Assembly it right? will go to the General right. Assembly the voting there uh, it will depend how voting will transpire right. again not much but it will send a signal that somebody is losing a high moral ground either South Africa's argument or uh, what America and the rest will be saying, depending on the numbers in right. terms of the votes. And, 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 and finally, don't forget this matter. It's not only before the ICJ. It right. is also before the International Criminal Court. Right. And the International Criminal Court is where the individuals uh, can be held accountable. Let's go to Jeremiah, then Mark, then Daniel in that order. Jeremiah, to you first. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I would like to start with uh, this one of the South Africa is, is achieved its objective, basically on the submission of these 84 pages of uh, uh, their their case. Because reason being, uh, it's been criti criticized where they were say that Israel and USA where they say that it's meritless, it's baseless. 
but when they judge the judge order and measures it can show you that when they they judge they say that the case of south africa of genocide is possible where you can see the all measures they they can't happen without the ceasefire i think these uh, judges they use other weight but not using the ceasefire because there's no way it can happen without ceasefire and the number two i would like to check on the uh, comment of israel based on this issue where they say that the court is biased is look on on other on one side not other side basically we know that hamas is not a it's not a state and hamas is it kind of by 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 uh, icj right. which is a uh, international court of law so and another thing that i will i will, I will just uh, will highlight there is the alliance or the support of the Israel, basically US, USA and other uh, West country. Automatically they will vote, vote, vote this one of uh, it, 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 uh, cancel, you and cancel. Right. So according to my view, according to my view, Israel it will, not, it, will, it will not stop what they are doing. If we check the numbers, the numbers they are told death is crazy each and every day. They show that they will not, uh, they will right. not abide by uh, international law. Jeremiah, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Um, yeah, th look, the numbers that I quoted earlier on was from President Cyril Ramaphosa's speech where he said, according to the United Nations, more than 25,000 people have been killed during Israel's war with Hamas. Among the dead are relief workers, UN staff, journalists, and more than 16,000 uh, of the dead are women and children. So that was pulled from that speech. Uh, let me hear from Mark and then Daniel. Mark? So notably, there is some data missing from your bar chart there where you have 15 to 2. The number of judges that voted in favor of stopping Israel from conducting its just war against Hamas was zero. So zero to 17. All the judges implicitly agree that Israel has a right to defend itself. All the measures do is explain um, how Israel must prosecute its war, which is to abide by the convention. Now, Professor Mononcela seems to want something more to say, well, these measures necessarily must include a ceasefire. Well, they don't, because um, what you must have when you're doing the killing um, for it to be um, a breach of the convention is genocidal intent. And that is something to be determined at a later stage. It is a tragic thing that in every single war, civilians will die. Uh, that is tragic. And that is, in this particular war, at the hands of Hamas. Hamas engaged in one of the worst attacks on Jews since the Holocaust, deliberately with genocidal intent, uh, killed men, women and children, um, engaged in a rape spree and um, burned children alive. Um, now, what Israel has done is to deliberately target Hamas, um, to warn civilians, to ensure that there are humanitarian corridors, provided a large amount of evidence to show that it is trying to preserve civilian life. And one way of thinking about this is to compare this conflict to other conflicts. So we know, for example, that the ratio um, of civilian to militant deaths in this particular um, um, military endeavor is two to one. Uh -huh. But if we compare that to the international standard, which is nine to one, so in other words, for every militant killed, nine civilians are killed. And if we look at, for example, the war in Yugoslavia, um, where NATO was trying to stop a genocide, you had four civilians killed for every Serbian militant. So there is a good evidence to think that um, Israel is not trying to kill civilians. Um, if you also compare the same number of days um, in Rwanda, there in a period of 100 days, one million people were killed with machetes. Now, Israel is has an enormously powerful army, uh, it could kill every single person in Gaza, but it has not. It has deliberately decided to take a view to eradicate Hamas and preserve civilian life. Mark. So it's libelous right. um, to claim otherwise. Furthermore, what Jody says is this idea that it's a wonderful thing that we've denuded the term genocide. That's an incredibly dangerous thing. This is the worst of all possible crimes. And so it is important that we respect its ordinary meaning. Once you start to change what genocide means, well, then we've sucked from the room the importance of what the term really means and that undermines genuine genocides right. it gives genocide ideas a license to say well if that counts to genocide well very well, dangerous all right mark thank you very much indeed let me hear from daniel and then i'm going to get final thoughts from professor madoncella as well as uh barrister hostel daniel daniel thank you I, I think your viewers and listeners have been treated to a very commendable display of Israeli talking points, which have been given tremendous airtime uh, tonight. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those talking points bear no resemblance whatsoever 
to the realities of what is going on. Every regime will have the people who are willing and happy to shill for it. That was true of the apartheid regime in South Africa, of course. There are four crucial spins that have been put forward here which need to be debunked. The first is that the ruling on the provisional measures at the International Court of Justice was somehow a result for Israel. The International Court of Justice, 15 to 2 in virtually every case, 16 to 1, even the Israeli judge voting with the majority on a couple of the measures, has said, number one, that Israel's attempt to say that there was no dispute, wrong. Number two, that it's not justiciable in the court, wrong. Number three, that there's no plausible concern on genocide here, mm. wrong. So Israel now stands in front of that court accused of genocide, and that will carry forward. So if that's what an Israeli success looks like, wow. I'd be fascinated wow. to know what failure looks like. Number two, you've been told that this war has been conducted trying to protect civilians. Let's remind ourselves, Save the Children has said that three times as many children Palestinian children have been killed in Gaza by this supposed attempt to protect civilians as are killed across the world in every conflict in any typical year for the last several years. Israel has devastated the civilian landscape. Four out of five people suffering from severe hunger in the world today are in Gaza because of what Israel has done. Number three, this attempt to suggest that it is somehow anti-Semitic or libelous to take Israel to the International Court of Justice does such an injustice mm. to the mm. Jews around the world who believe that never again is for anyone. Mm. And mm. there were brave, courageous Jewish people who stood against apartheid then. Right. And it's important for your viewers to know that there are Jewish people who stand against apartheid today. And finally, the suggestion that this is a failure for South Africa. The world is looking at South Africa and seeing a state and it shouldn't matter what your political affiliations are in South Africa. Right. This is a right. state that has stood up for justice and is tremendously commendable in having done so. Daniel, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Natasha uh, Hausdorff and uh, Professor Chilimo Dunsela, I've got literally a minute left, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds each. Uh, first barrister to you. Well, unfortunately, the propagation of these utter falsehoods, in particular from those on the ground that are under the control of Hamas, uh, has led many, otherwise I'm sure, uh, right-thinking people who care about civilian casualties uh, astray in this regard. Then the fact that uh, UN bodies are being quoted uh, here on this panel, but also by the court, is extremely concerning in the context of just now, UNRWA being uh, uh, under Philippe Lazzarini, who was quoted by the court, of course, um, UNRWA has had its funding uh, suspended by a number of states on the basis uh, that its uh, staff have been complicit in the massacre, the real genocide uh, mm. that occurred on the 7th of October. In that context, to hear Hamas propaganda repeated as we have just now, uh, and also by the International Court of Justice, is not a victory for anyone. It is not a victory for the South Africans, uh, who should rightly right. expect their government to be attending to the dire situation at home, rather than playing politics on behalf of a terrorist organization. It is not a victory for the Israelis, clearly, uh, who are having to deal with these increasing blood libels being propagated. It is certainly right. not a victory for the Palestinians in Gaza, who are continuing to be oppressed, butchered, Barrister. slaughtered by the Hamas yeah. that control them. I'm really being pushed uh, by my producers, but I thank you very much indeed. Professor, uh, last word to you. Detachment is a victory not just for South Africa, for Palestinians, for Israelis, and for all human beings who love peace, who believe in shared humanity, and who respect international law. One of the observations by the ICJ was that Israel has for many years been ignoring resolutions of the United Nations. It was a good thing that finally there is accountability. And it's not true that there was no provisional findings. There were provisional findings as a basis for providing the remedial um, the provisional um, directives right. that the court provided. And for me, it's sad, really, that politics are being used to interpret 
a judgment. Mm -hmm. My request to anybody who's listening to this is please read the judgment. It's very simple. South Africa won on every allegation it made. When it came to the remedial action, right. it, the court could not order um, it, it, the court could not order ceasefire because Hamas is not a country or a government within right. a country. And lastly, stop using the idea that just because genocide was coined when Jews were victims of the Holocaust, together with six million other non-Jews, mm. Jews are capable of committing genocide. Right. In fact, it's been proven that people who have been the subject of cruelty are more likely to be cruel. Professor, thank you, thank you so much uh, to all my guests. It pains me to wrap up the, this discussion, but uh, we've run out of time. So thank you so much. Look, we will continue this discussion, no doubt, as all these developments unfold. But thank you very much indeed for your time. Sophie, as always, I will tell you, go and have a rest. But I know it's not in your DNA to have a rest, but we thank you for the, your hard work that you put in over the past couple of months. All right, before we go, here's my take. Look, the situation in the Middle East is, is complex and polarizing. And if you are viewing the situation from afar, there are a couple of questions that you can ask yourself to get a, get a bit of a check on your viewpoint. Are you looking at the situation through the lens of what you want it to be or are you being objective? Over the past couple of months, you've heard the different stories. The October 7th attack resulting in the deaths of many Israelis and the taking of hostages and the subsequent response from Israel resulting in the loss of thousands of Palestinians. I'm not trying to equate. That's not the intention. The intention is to get to this point. There is a nucleus of fact here that is familiar. Pain, suffering. There needs to come, you know, we need to come to a time when the focus shifts to healing and reconciliation, lasting peace, how crucial will the recent ICJ order be in getting to that end goal? We shall see. And as you know, those are the three of the most loaded words in geopolitics. And that's my take. If you miss anything, be sure to catch this program on YouTube. It's topical. Uh, Sports Live up next. If you're watching a repeat of this program, then as always, the news continues. Until next week, my brothers and sisters. Take care. Bye-bye.